Hello and welcome to part four and the final video in the series of my favorite varieties from the 2021 gardening season in my zone 6A Ohio garden. In today's video, I'll be covering my favorites from the fall garden. And if you haven't already, be sure to check out videos one through three, where I show my favorites from the spring, early summer, and late summer garden. One thing I did wanna mention before I jump in is that a lot of these varieties do awesome in both the spring and the fall. I did have a few varieties that I grew either only in the fall or I feel like do better specifically in the fall, and I will call those out. A broccoli is one of my favorite crops to grow both in the spring and the fall. And I typically just grow the same varieties both seasons. This year, I decided to try a few varieties that were marketed specifically as being good for the fall growing season. The first one that I grew is a variety called Gypsy, available from Territorial Seeds. And I really liked this one because it had a nice compact plant. This would be a great variety if you were short on space. And it was also very quick to mature that main head. And after that was harvested, I was able to get some side shoots harvested off of those plants as well. Now one of the best things about Gypsy is that it is a very stress tolerant variety. So it will put up with things like heat and less than optimal soil better than some of your other broccoli varieties. And I found that to be true in this fall planting because while I'm harvesting in the fall, I'm typically planting these transplants out um, in the heat of late summer. So they really don't have the most cushy start to their lives. They go out in the hottest part of the year. There's usually less rainfall. I do typically water them in when I transplant, but that's about all the babying along that they get. So being more tolerant to stressors is a really nice trait for <laughs> for fall broccoli to have here in my growing area. The second broccoli variety that I really liked in the fall is a variety called Emerald Crown available from Johnny's. And I picked this one up because Johnny's had it listed as their best fall variety for the East. Now I'm not necessarily in the East, but I'm close enough that I figured a variety that does well for them would also do well here. And Emerald Crown did not disappoint. This one had a little bit bigger plants than Gypsy. It was a little bit later, um, like about two weeks later maturity, which actually ended up being really nice because by the time I was finished harvesting and eating my Gypsy broccoli heads, I was starting the harvest of Emerald Crown. But overall, I was really happy with the performance. It had great flavor. It's a variety that I will be growing again in the fall for sure. Onto Brussels sprouts, I wasn't entirely sure which season to put Brussels sprouts in because they're a little bit of an outlier in my garden in that they're not on the same schedule as any of my other brassicas. So with all my other brassicas, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, those all typically get planted spring and fall. With Brussels sprouts here, I do one planting, typically starting my seed indoors around the end of March, transplanting out anywhere mid-May through mid-June, and then harvesting anywhere from August to January, depending on the variety. So I threw Brussels sprouts in the fall because that's when I am harvesting all of my sprouts. This year I had four different varieties and out of those I had one that was my absolute favorite. It's a new variety called Sylvia and this one's available from Gurney Seed. What I liked about Sylvia is that, again, it had that compact plant, which with some of the Brussels sprouts I grew this year, I had issues with them getting too tall and then I was having to support them or they were collapsing over and lying in the dirt. And Sylvia, because it only grew to about three feet, was very stout. It was self-supporting. I didn't have issues with it collapsing. I really liked that growth habit. And then even for the relatively shorter stalk size, it put on a lot of sprouts and good size sprouts. This one had the biggest sprouts in my trials this year. The other thing I liked was the early maturity. And I know I harp on earliness a lot with all of these varieties, but I really do prefer a, a faster maturing variety for most everything that I'm growing. And Sylvia actually started producing in mid August for me and I was harvesting up through, um, I think I finished mid-November or so with that one. It seemed to be very, very heat tolerant in that I didn't have issues with the sprouts opening up, which will happen sometimes when you're growing the plants during times of 
extreme heat. This one stayed nice and tight. In the future, I will probably actually plant this one later so that I'm timing those harvests more for like mid-September onward, only because as with all Brussels sprouts, the flavor improves as you get into the colder weather. So with a really early maturing variety like this, I'm gonna push back my planting. But overall, I was really happy with the performance and the eating quality of Sylvia. Now I talked about a lot of lettuces in the spring. I regrew all of those that I mentioned in the fall as well, but there's one variety that I like to grow every single fall. It has been a favorite of mine for years, and that is a variety called Winter Density available from Seed Savers Exchange. I have loved this one for years, but it was not until recently that I found out that this is actually a romaine by a bib or butter crunch lettuce cross. I, for years, I thought it was just a straight romaine and I couldn't figure out why I liked this one so much better than all my other romaines. So mystery solved. Um, it does have a more compact head than a lot of other romaines. So it stays fairly compact. All of the leaves are really tightly packed in there. And what I like so much about winter density is it does have that nice, crunch and that little bit of a peppery flavor that you get from the romaine but the leaf texture itself tends to be a little bit more tender flavorful I'm, I'm guessing getting that from its bib parentage but at any rate it's one of my favorite lettuces of all time and it does hold up to the cold very well this one i've never tried growing uncovered all winter but it does really well underneath like a heavyweight frost blanket or something like that. And I've been harvesting this one in January before and it's still really nice. Kind of the same deal with carrots. I mentioned a lot in the spring and I wanna mention just one for the fall season. And it is a variety called Napoli carrot available from Gurney Seed. And this is my all time favorite carrot for the fall growing slot. I've grown it in the spring as well and I don't feel like it is as good grown in the spring as it is in the fall. Many carrots will develop better flavor in cooler weather, but Napoli really, really shines. Um, some of the best carrots I have ever eaten in my life have been fall planted Napoli's that I've kept under a row cover and harvested like mid-December to early January. They just develop exceptional sugars. They have a perfectly crispy, crunchy texture without being dense. They're just, just a really good carrot. And now I want some, and unfortunately I've already eaten all of, the, all of the ones I planted this fall. The other thing I really like about Napoli is it does relatively well in my heavy soil. So I don't get perfect, beautiful carrots, but it does seem to power down through my heavier clay type soil better than many other varieties of carrots. Amico Chinese cabbage available from Gurney Seed is one that I grew both spring and fall and it performed great in both seasons. Now, if you are a fan of cabbage, but have only ever grown the traditional ball headed cabbage, I highly recommend giving Chinese or Napa cabbage a try. Um, eating quality wise, it's almost like crossing a sturdier, like romaine type lettuce with cabbage. So the texture is going to be more tender and crunchy than a typical cabbage. And the taste is very sweet and mild with just a hint of that cabbagey type flavor. I really like Chinese cabbage for either shredding up raw into salads or just really lightly stir frying or sauteing. Now, Amico is a really nice variety because again, it's early maturing and it's a nice mid-size head. So I've grown both mini and giant Chinese cabbages. And for what my family of four eats, that Amico medium-sized head is a really nice amount. I have found that this variety is very easy to grow. It's very reliable. And I think flavor-wise, it's the tops of any Chinese cabbage variety that I've grown. It is easy to grow. That being said, the critters still love it. So if you have issues like I do with cabbage worms, or if you have issues with slugs, um, rabbits getting into your garden, definitely protect these plants. I put an insect netting cover over mine as soon as my transplants go out because I know that the critters will go 
straight for those plants. They seem to know the most tender, tasty varieties that I plant and will always go to those first. And so Amico gets extra protection. A must have spring and fall crop for me is spinach. And both of these varieties, I grew both in the spring and the fall and they did really well during both seasons. The first variety is a variety called Orac and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'm not for sure. And it is available from Johnny's Seed. And Orac is actually an oriental leaf type. So the leaf is very, very smooth. It has no wrinkling or bubbling like a Savoy or semi-Savoy type. And in the past, I have shied away from growing those oriental type spinaches because for whatever reason, they don't seem to hold up in storage for me. So I would harvest them in the morning, get them in the refrigerator. And if I didn't have those things eaten within a couple days, the leaves just got really like, <laughs> like droopy and not very appealing. The Savoy and semi-Savoy leaf types hold up much better for me. So the first thing that impressed me about Orac was that this one actually held up quite well in the fridge after picking. Still not as well as a Savoy type, but much better than any other oriental leaf type that I've grown. Now, Orac can be picked baby size or full size, but it really does shine as a baby leaf. So if you're picking them at about this size and throwing them into a fresh salad, it's a really exceptional eating spinach. The other nice thing is it has fast regrowth. So if you harvest those baby leaves and then let the plants go, they generally will grow back quite quickly for another harvest as long as the weather is staying cool and cooperating. And Auric is resistant to downy mildew, which is great if you are growing in a place where you're dealing with that pathogen. The second variety called Acadia, available from Gurney Seed, is also resistant to downy mildew. And this one is more that traditional semi-savoy leaf shape. So these produce really big, beautiful, dark green, healthy looking leaves. Again, it could be used at baby or full size. This one I actually preferred using at that full mature leaf size. And because of its kind of more substantial texture, this was the one that I went to if I was cooking. So if I was sauteing the spinach or throwing it into soups or stews or casseroles, this variety was my pick for that usage. And while it's really a non-issue in the fall for me, Acadia does have great bolt tolerance. So when I'm growing in the spring and we're going into those warmer days when a lot of my cold hardy leafy greens want to bolt, Acadia allowed me an extended harvest, a good, I'd say two, maybe three weeks longer than some of my other spinach varieties that had already bolted. Kale is another leafy green that I grow both spring and fall. And this year I grew all of these varieties during both seasons. The first one I wanna mention is a new variety called Rainbow Candy Crush available from Young Seeds. And while yield and plant performance was great both seasons, I really prefer this one in the fall only because the color intensify so much as I go into the colder weather. I just don't get that intense, gorgeous color from a spring planting. Rainbow Candy Crush could easily double as an ornamental. I could see this one tucked into flower beds or containers with pansies or other cold season flowers. It's a really beautiful plant and it stays kind of in this compact rounded head a lot like the original um, ornamental kales that were on the market. Unlike those kales, this one <laughs> is actually edible. So it's got a more tender, less fibrous texture. It's got better sugars. That being said, it is still kale. So if you're not a big fan of kale, you're probably not gonna love this one either. <laughs> But if you like kale, Rainbow Candy Crush has great eating quality. And like I mentioned, that color. So anytime you grow it, it's got kind of a purpley pink tinge to the veins and the foliage. But as soon as those first couple of frost hit in the fall, that pink color turned into this vibrant glowing fuchsia and only got more intense as the winter progressed. I grew this one two falls ago and it overwintered in my garden under a row cover. This year I've got it planted out with no protection at all. I'm gonna see if it makes it through the entire winter. 
but it's definitely a cold hardy kale. Now, another gorgeous kale is a variety called Sunbor, available from Gurney Seed. And I feel like you could plant this one and Rainbow Candy Crush and just probably forego the flowers altogether. This one is a purple curly leafed kale and it is really stunning. And this one, the color, I think does get a little more intense in the cold, but it was just as beautiful in the spring going into summer as it was in my fall garden. Sunbor has really, really nice uniform plants, really puts on a lot of foliar growth. So I got a ton of harvest off of this one and it has a pretty standard kale flavor. The last variety is one called Mamba from Johnny's Seed. And this is a Nero di Toscano or dinosaur kale type. So it's got these great big upright, um, dark, lovely, lovely dark blue green leaves. You'll also see this type referred to as like a black palm or black cabbage. Now as compared to the old La Senado type kales, I felt like Mamba was much more vigorous. So it just kind of jumped out of the ground from seeding and put on a lot of really quick growth. And I got a higher yield off of this one than I did the old standard La Senado kale. Eating quality was excellent. I feel like La Senado kales in general are just one of the best types of kale for eating. They're my favorites to do things like kale chips with or throw into soups and stews. And Mamba was great for all of those uses. I had Verde di Taglio chard planted in my spring and fall garden as well. And this is a variety available from Seeds from Italy. This is a variety I had read about years back. It was an article in some magazine talking to a chef about their favorite varieties. And she happened to mention this Verde di Taglio and how her kids would actually eat it. And I thought, I'm sold. If I can get my kids to eat green leafy stuff without complaining, I've got to try this variety. Um, long story short, my kids still don't want to eat green leafy stuff, but I fell in love with Verde de Taglio. So this one is not a fantastic showy plant like the rainbow lights chard or any of the chards that have the colored stems. Verde de Taglio has a very thin, tender kind of light green to cream colored stem, just a standard green leaf, but the eating quality is exceptional. So a nice tender leaf, like I said, a thin tender midrib or stem, and it's got this savory, almost slightly salty flavor that adds a really nice element when you're cooking it or throwing it into salads. I feel like sometimes with the leafy greens, it kind of just tastes like you're eating grass, but I really appreciate the flavor of the Verde de Taglio. Hakurai salad turnips were a garden staple in the fall for me for many, many years. But the last couple of falls, I have been planting a variety called Amelie, available from Gurney's Seed. And much like Hakurai, this is a white salad turnip. And salad turnips in general are worlds apart in terms of eating quality from the old storage turnips. So something like your purple top white globe. Salad turnips like Amelie, have this really nice kind of popping crisp texture. So think of almost like a really nice radish. They've got that crisp fine grained flesh and a really sweet, mild flavor. And my favorite thing to do with salad turnips is just slice them up, sprinkle them with salt and eat them like that. The one thing I did notice about Amelie is that it seemed to be a little bit slower in terms of germination and that beginning growth that it put on for the first couple weeks. But after that point, it really jumped into growth and it caught up with Hakurai very quickly. And I was harvesting both varieties at approximately the same time in the fall. The salad turnips offer a two in one type of crop because the greens can also be eaten. Honestly, I almost always end up just throwing my turnip greens to the chickens <laughs> because during that time of year, I've got such a surplus of leafy greens that I really don't need anymore and the chickens enjoy them. But if you were limited on space and knew that you wanted some greens as well as a root crop, salad turnips are a great option for that. And finally, of course, I have to talk about garlic in the fall. So garlic is a crop that typically gives me no trouble here in Ohio. It's super easy to grow. Basically, I throw some bulbs in the ground in late fall, mulch them, feed them in the spring if I remember, and that's about it. Usually I have a really nice harvest of garlic 
no matter what. This year, however, was a little more challenging for the garlic. The first issue that I had was that voles were tunneling directly under my bulbs. And while the voles didn't disturb the garlic itself, their tunneling did disrupt the roots and the bulbs that I had planted a lot. So it was just kind of adding to the stress that the bulbs were dealing with by having tunnels directly underneath them or shifting positions after they'd already been established was not ideal. The second big issue was that if at all possible, you want it to be dry the week or two before garlic harvest. And for some reason this year, we were relatively dry through the spring and the early summer. But when it came time for the garlic harvest, I had the same issue with onions this year, we got a fair amount of rain right about the time that they should have been dug. So my garlic sat out in the wet garden two weeks longer than it should have. And by the time I was able to get in and get it harvested, a lot of my bulbs had split open. Um, I did have some issues with post storage kind of rots setting in. And I point this all out only, <laughs> only to establish the fact that the few varieties that I'm gonna mention that did really, really exceptional this past year were up against a little more than my garlic typically is. And all three varieties that I'm going to mention came from Fillory Garlic Farms. Now I have a soft spot in my heart for big old bulbs of garlic with big fat chunky cloves. There, there's just something really satisfying about pulling apart a bulb of garlic and having these great big massive cloves to chop up and use. And I had a couple of hard necks this year that really came through with that trait. The first variety was Romanian red and it had about five to six really nice size cloves per bulb and a really fantastic pungent flavor. This one was probably my favorite for roasting. The second variety is one called German white. It's also known as German extra hearty. And again, five to six nice big fat cloves per bulb. This one has a really long lasting pungency. So if you're doing some like Italian cooking where you really want that garlic flavor to come through, I felt like this was a good choice. This one is also supposed to be an excellent choice for areas where there are very, very cold, very challenging winters. So not necessarily the case here, but if you're farther north than me, this might be a good option for you. Romanian red and German white were both hard neck varieties. I did have one soft neck this year that I was impressed with. And in general, I don't grow a lot of soft neck garlics because A, a lot of them don't perform as well in my climate and B, they don't tend to make nice big cloves. They've typically got smaller cloves, but more per bulb than a hard neck garlic. But this year I was impressed with a variety called Silver White. And initially I chose it because Fillory Farm said that this variety was a good soft neck for climates with cold winters and hot summers. And I thought, Huh, that's me, I'll give that one a try. And this one did really well in my Ohio climate. It was quite productive. Again, the bulbs were not as big and the cloves were smaller than my hard necks, but I got a lot of cloves per bulb. This one also has a milder flavor. So when I'm doing something like a salad dressing where I'm adding in raw garlic or just basically any application where I'd be using the garlic raw, this is the one that I tend to use versus those more pungent hard neck varieties that I mentioned. And this one was really, really nice for braiding. Now my garlic braiding abilities obviously need a little work, but this gets the job done. And this is a really nice way to store garlic. And the other thing I wanted to mention about garlic is that no matter what variety I grow, one of the traits that it has to have to, <laughs> to be one that I grow again is that it has to store really well and it has to last a long time in storage. And with all three of these varieties that I mentioned here, as of the end of January, they're still holding up in storage really, really well. Um, what I like to see is a variety that can last until the spring without sprouting. So hopefully we'll get to that point with these, but I'm happy with them so far. 
So that wraps up my fall favorites from 2021, as well as the entire 2021 favorite series. Very soon I will be jumping into the 2022 gardening season full bore. So be sure to subscribe if you'd like to stay up to date on my garden tours, tips and tricks, as well as a few random garden experiments that I like to do. And I'd love to hear from you. If you have a favorite variety or varieties that you love in your garden, be sure to drop a line in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.